Oh. Sorry. Okay. Um, <clears throat> from the day he was born, do, 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 he was trouble. Mm, 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 mm. His, all he wanted was rock and roll porn and a motorbike. This is not from He Bimmer was on the, roof. the thorn in his mutter's side. She tried in vain, but he never caused her anything but pain. He left home the day she died. Come on. You didn't know this reference? Okay. Why are you surprised that I continue to not know these references <sighs> that either predate or postdate my existence? This one, neither. And I'm trying to... Because it's not real. I think the internet is going to tell you you're wrong. I'll tell you what, the internet's going to crucify me for screwing up half of the words in that song. The internet is also going to crucify you for coughing on me, especially at a time like this. Okay, the time like this hadn't happened yet, Derek. Yeah, so we should probably clarify there's a dirty little secret which kind of popped up in the last episode, which is that we tend to record these a little bit in advance. Yeah. Uh, and so this episode and the following episode, and actually also the previous episode, were all filmed before the great sadness uh, yep. that we're all currently experiencing. So while I was indeed coughing on Derek and we were probably not social distancing enough, we are now. We are both in... We're in different counties, in fact. We are in different, we are in different counties. Uh, so we can still see and talk to each other thanks to the miracle of modern technology and we will be recording more curmudgeons uh, away from each other because I don't want to <coughs> cough on him anymore. <coughs> I'm fully on board with this plan. Uh, okay. So yes, without further ado, let's return to your efforts to draw an increasingly tenuous connection between some movie that like theoretically existed at some point in the past and like actual content that people I think are signed up to listen to. Okay, the best part of this whole thing is I can just hang up on you. So, bye. And the thing is, this, this particular song has a direct connection to the, the topic that I want to talk about today. Um, so what this, if I don't want to talk about okay, the same hold on. topic? Let me see if you understand this. Touch, 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 touch me. I want to be dirty. Thrill me, chill me, fulfill me. No? I'm not saying that to you about it. Okay. So this is the thing. That was Susan Sarandon. That was her start. It was a movie called uh, The Rocky Horror Picture Show, which was kind of a musical. Um, and the, again, total direct connection to what I want to talk about. So Rocky Horror Picture Show was about a transsexual from Transylvania. Uh, which got me thinking about trans and you know first about like trans people and then about drag queens and people don't really think about this but drag and trans are not the same thing both cool which got me thinking about rupaul's drag race which made me of course start thinking about drag racing which made me start thinking about fast cars and how fast cars are a lot of fun and there's a lot of acceleration going on but really the fastest cars are automatic except i don't like automatic transmissions the only trans things i don't really like so that got me back to the whole trans thing and i thought well after the transmission comes the axles and that got me to think about trans axles and led me to the conclusion that there are not there was never has never been a single trans axle car that's not cool all from singing a song uh, that Susan Sarandon sang. Do you need coffee? You seem low energy. We should get you a coffee. The song I should have. Also be a uh, <laughs> direct connection, like you said. Totally direct connection. Yes. That was very clear. Yeah, I, I actually should have just sang crazy. <laughs> crazy. Uh, but so you said one connection. word in there which I understood, and that was transaxle. Yes. Uh, so am I to take all of that to mean that you want to talk about transaxles? Yeah. Now? This is the. Okay. Trans episode. All right, now of you're the, speaking the my Carmudgeon language. Show. All right, welcome to another <laughs> very direct, complete, and clear episode of the Carmudgeon Show. Show? I can't speak. You do it. We're going to talk about cars that have trans axles. Specifically, let us, I think, start with some definitions. Uh, how would you define, Mr. Camisa, a trans axle? It's actually not up to me. Um, I think somebody else decided this a while ago. If you were to adhere to the conventionally agreed upon definition of transaxle and parrot it back to me, what would you say? Ah, Polly want a cracker! Um, <laughs> I'm going home. It's going to be one of those episodes. Um, yes, Derek Tam Hyphen Scott. The, uh, the generally accepted definition of a transaxle is a device that includes both a transmission and a differential. So mm -hmm. technically, 
every front wheel drive, let me think about this, every front engine front wheel drive car on sale today has a transaxle in it because there's transmission and then there's the differential that goes straight to the axles. So that's kind of boring. I don't think we should talk about that genre of car. I don't, I don't really think, yeah, that would mean every Audi is a transaxle. Anything with a transverse four cylinder from a Honda Civic and like a Peugeot 106. Why, why do you have to be exclusive like that? What about a transverse V6 or transverse V8? <laughs> transverse V12. What is the finest transverse V8 car in the world? Sorry, front, Ferrari front, 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 front. Oh, that oh, front oh. engine, front, front. Yes. No, <laughs> we're talking drive. like Monte Carlo SS. Yeah, and like mm -hmm. Impalas and that whole uh, Cadillac. Any of the North Star cars? Yeah. They were fu they were extra fucked up because not only was the North Star sideways. Hold on, was it transverse? They were transverse, but they actually had a chain drive to the transmission. So a chain like came off the Like in 1909 when cars used to be chain drive? Or instead. in the 1979 Saab 900, Saab 99 was had a chain. I'm sure there were other cars with chain drives. So that's not the transaxle we want to talk about. GM did their first chain drive in a front engine, I think it was longitudinal, in the Toronado, the Oldsmobile Toronado, that was chain yes. drive too. All kinds of fucked up shit. Wow. Yeah. That's but yes, that is unsettling. Not uh, by the same token, all cars that have engines in the back Maybe kind of be transaxle too. Let's think about this. So technically, so uh, you could separate the transmission from the differential, like in the Countach, because the transmission is in front of the engine and the differential is presumably somewhere in the vicinity of the rear axle. I have no idea the way that layout works. I know I've seen it. I've been under those cars. I've looked at them. I'm scared of them. I run. The gearbox is in front of the, the whole engine. Fuck thing. The whole thing is so fucked up. You can't tell what's you know what. That could be one of the one. That could be a. That's not a rear engine car. That's a mid engine car. But that could yes, have. But a any separate. car with the engine in the the aft of the passenger compartment is mo likely to have a transaxle. Has suspect. there ever been a? Yeah. Hold on. Hold. Yes, you're right. I mean, we sort of, we have these weird exceptions, like Ferrari has the Quattro Ruote Motrici, Motrici, whatever it's pronounced, 4RM, the FF, F, um, had a transaxle, a front engine transaxle, but then a second transmission up front, and that was also Yes, so the transaxle, transaxle definition that we're actually trying to focus on right now, I think, is cars that have the engine in the front, and the transmission and tra and differential, i.e. transaxle, at the back. Yes. And those are the cars that... Has there ever been a car in that configuration? So from, from this point forward, I'm going to suggest we just use that as, a, transaxle. As, as transaxle, and then we have now solved the like potential internet troll, like, but wait, ex as asterisk, like, mm -hmm. you know, long technical description from some person who clearly hasn't anything better to do with their time or life than call a then watch bunch this of fucking jackasses show, yeah. out on the internet. Uh, <laughs> in any case, transaxle from this point forward, may I suggest, is a reference to engine front tra transaxle back. Yes. Uh, and I think that all of the cars that match that description are like to some extent kind of cool. Like what is the least cool car that has that configuration? So, or let's start with some contemporary examples of cars that meet that. Okay, there, I was gonna say there aren't, there aren't all that many. Correct. So current cars that have transaxles. Ferraris, Yes. A12 is a transaxle. Uh huh. Um, and so does the eight cylinder Lusso, because that's rear wheel drive. Yes, are they transaxle cars? I mean, there's, I don't know. yes. Should we go the, look? <laughs> no, there, yeah, there's true. That is an eight-cylinder transaxle. And the Portofino is, Portofino is also transaxle. So Ferrari's stuff, all their Ferrari stuff, front engine stuff is transaxle. Ferrari likes a lot of weight in the back of their car, in fact. They have several times. If you times, know what I mean. I don't know what you mean. And I'm going to move a little bit. Am I out of frame yet? Because <laughs> I, I, I think this is just going to be Derek by himself. Uh, so there's additionally uh, Corvette. Do they still do that? Or the the, the well, front engine Corvettes. Yeah, Corvette is now mid-engine. Uh, prior to, and thus has a transaxle, but not in the way that we're describing it. Correct. Um, yes, C7 Corvette had a transaxle. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we also have... Uh, let's maybe also discuss why someone would ever do that. Hmm. Well, for the Italian car company, it's very simple. First of all, Ferrari has said many times that they actually prefer a rear biased weight distribution. They found that they can uh, achieve ideal handling with more weight in the back, and that's really the reason why car companies It's a result of traction. Uh, yeah, more, tr more traction, or more weight over the rear wheels means more grip. 
Um, mm -hmm. so, That's why it's so easy to do a burnout in a pickup truck with nothing in the back of it. Is that something you would ever do? No, of course not. Have you, I mean, drive a pickup truck. Have you ever driven a pickup truck? Oh, yeah. Okay. Like anything good? An F350 Super Duty. That's pretty good. What about like a 454 SS or a Raptor or a Lightning or a, mm -hmm. none of the cool stuff? Mm -hmm. They do epic, like pickup trucks do the best burnouts. Yeah, because there's no weight on the rear tires. Do you know what pickup truck does the best burnouts in the world ever of all time? I do not. But you know, I'm going to tell you this, right? And you know it's going to have a fucking VW badge on it because it's me. Caddy? Volkswagen Caddy. Because they're front engine, front wheel drive with this big, ridiculous long bed with a huge overhang, which means if you put a lot of weight behind the rear axle, i.e. you fold down the, the tailgate, thingy, tailgate and, put a bunch of and you get like heavy five friends. guys on there, there's no weight on the, front, on the front of the car. So you pull the e-brake, you get your, your fattest friends to go on the back and just dump it in second gear and they will do second gear burnouts. But anyway, I digress. Um, weight distribution, yes. The reason that you would do this is because the heaviest part, heaviest individual part of a car is the engine, and the transmission is second in most cases. Uh, so you can separate those masses for better weight distribution. So you can put weight in the front and the back, which is nice because normally in a front wheel or front engined car, there's too much weight on the front axles, which usually causes undesirable steering characteristics. Go drive an Audi. Exactly. Uh, so this was happened upon, I don't know, many moons ago. Many moons ago. I think actually one of the first, I'm going to use a phone here, um, which Ooh, is connecting to the cardinal, internet. Cardinal rule. Carmudginal rule. Um, okay, so I was wrong. I was going to say some car was the first transaxle cars, front engine rear wheel drive transaxle car, but it is actually the 1898 De Dion Bouton. Huh. Which is interesting because I didn't realize De Dion was a car manufacturer. I mean, you I only think know it's about the same De Dion guy? suspension. How, how many people could there be in the car industry with the name De Dion? Huh. I mean, there weren't that many French people. I mean, it's like German Daimler and British Daimler. Actually, they were related. Right. Daimler. <coughs> Daimler. Daimler and Daimler. Um, I feel like, so the reason that we happened upon this idea is that we were talking about Alpha. So this sort of like, first transaxle car that I ever saw underneath and like mind blown was, uh, I think it was a GTV6. Um, and you know, that is Busso front, Busso V6 up front, five speed at the back, crazy linkage so that the, you know, never quite worked a lot. And inboard disc brakes, which meant that basically if you try to track one of these cars, you overheat the rear brakes because they're out of the airflow and they then therefore- Transfer all of the heat directly to the gearbox, which then shatters. Blows up, exactly, in spec spectacular style because often what it does is it overheats the axle, the output shafts on the differential. So they start leaking transmission fluid, which then touches the brakes, which then catches them on fire and makes a very lovely smoke screen. Fire. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Alfa Romeo started doing this in the 1970s when they replaced the GTV and so they had the Alfetta. Uh, and that car was a four-cylinder, like, coupe, but there was also a sedan version, so very small number of transaxle sedans. Uh, I think if you, so, like, in modern time, aside from the De Dion Bouton, uh, I think that Lancia probably played a role in this, and I do, like, wholeheartedly feel like we should do a Lancia episode, because especially, like, in the f first 50 years of their history, they did all this crazy innovative stuff, a lot of it which, which caught on and is still used today, and then, like, a substantial wait, wait. portion of which... Caught on fire? Or uh, just probably, caught on. but also <laughs> caught on. Uh, no, they were like high quality cars. Uh, in any case, uh, in the 1950s at least, maybe earlier, Lancia was making transaxle cars. Uh, and I can look this up. Yeah, they made the, the Aurelias were all transaxle. Uh, 1950 to 1958 for the Aurelia. Yes, and then the Flaminia, which was the replacement for the Aurelia, also had a transaxle. 57 to 70. And in both cases, they were available as sedans, which is kind of an unusual packaging choice because usually what is required is a sizable bulge in the underside of the floor where the transmission, to clear the transmission, which is generally not good for like human occupancy. Uh, so Completely incompatible with human occupancy. Yeah, so normally cars that are transaxle in this way are, tend not to be sedans because it creates some packaging constraints, but uh, Alfa Romeo and Lancia both made transaxle sedans. And as you alluded to, the, uh, the Quattro Porte, Maserati Quattro Porte is also a transaxle sedan. 
I, I do say on the way here, I sheared a hub off, and so I have Maybe a, you should get tires that are less grippy. Right? So we it can needs like, an alignment. Look, camber. Negative camber, or that's stanced. There we go, there we go. What's up? The Quattroporte, this generation at least, was, were all of them? No. Just, That's the only, only one, and only when it's available with the manual, with the manual. transmission. Well, the, uh, the Cambio manual. Corsa, yeah. sorry, the F1 gearbox instead of the uh, automatic, which I guess they couldn't, well, you can't. Can you? Yeah, you can yeah, do you an can. automatic transaxle because yep. the Porsche 928 had an automatic transaxle. I think the reason that, uh, that Maserati switched to a f conventional transmission layout on this car uh, halfway through the production was that they couldn't fit the automatic in the back. It's very wide, mm -hmm. that automatic. It was a 5 HP or a 6 HP ZF, Six. very wide. Um, so they, they had no choice but to, um, but to put the transmission in a conventional layout. But there are very few sedans. I think that we just named, or I just named them all. I think no? it's this car. OK, hold on. This car. The Aurelia, the Flaminia, oh, there's a real the one over Alfetta, there. Uh, don't slip on the fluids. Uh, what else? There's another one? <laughs> I'm, I'll give you a hint, two hints. The first hint is the accent with which I'm speaking right now, and the second one is the most beautiful oh, sedan uh, repeat. ever. Aston Martin Rapide. The Rapide, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yes, that is... Stunningly beautiful and absolutely gorgeous to drive. Yeah. Um, I think my coffee might be arriving via Uber Eats, so I apologize. Well, I'm going to run out of frame and give this <laughs> my phone. <laughs> this is very high professional. So you're getting more coffee mm -hmm. after all of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't actually have a lot of coffee earlier, and I think that's why I made that strangely tenuous because your, connection between... Because your synapses are deficient in caffeine right now. What could I have possibly ever come up with for the idea of a transaxle? I mean, there is no song about transaxle. And, you know, we came up with the stupid idea that we should start every episode with... Who is we? Me and Luca, our chief marketing officer, your okay. boss. All right. <sighs> Luca, this is all your fault. Anyway, um, uh -huh. I need coffee. It's, you know, been an hour. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yes. Could have so the, the Rapide is, in addition to be stunning, is being stunningly beautiful, a hell of a performer, um, and to your point, has no backseat room mm. whatsoever. I mean, genuinely embarrassing. And so it, the the idea kind of works for these cars where people are willing to compromise on the sort of sedan part, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why only the British and Italians do it, and the Germans are like, we would never do this. This makes no this sense. This makes no sense. Like, except, hold on. Does, has any German done it? Not in a sedan. Hmm. The, other, the other issue, yeah, that's what I'm saying, with a, with a sedan. I mean, because the Panamera is front transmission. The other issue is that you can't add four-wheel drive unless you're Nissan. Or Ferrari. Or Ferrari. <laughs> I, well, Ferrari had to come up with that novel solution. But, but Nissan, my favorite part of the GTR is hmm. that the front end is as high as an F-150, and there's a reason for it. So you have a front engine, a V6, which is... As it, and that's a 60, so the 90 would be here, a 60 is there. It's a much taller engine than a 90-degree than a V6 would be, or like a slant 6 or something. Um, so you have a tall engine to begin with, and then you have a transaxle, so the power's got to go all the way back. And then it has to go back forward again, and it can't route through the engine block. I mean, it could. Other car companies have done that. But it goes underneath it, so they've... Nissan had to raise the engine and raise the engine and raise the engine. It's part of the reason why the GTR is so truckish in appearance. Um, it's a rear transaxle with a, a, a with, so it's got a torque tube on the way back and then a drive shaft that goes forward to a diff. Um, I yeah, can't insane. believe that the Japanese of all people would do something like that. That sounds so German. Although I also don't think anybody, yeah, only the Germany, Germanies, the, only the Japanese or Germans, the Axis powers of World War II, could get something like that to work. I... I'm going to disagree with you for one. I have this theory that in all engineering, Americans dream it up and try to make it happen and invariably don't make it 
work all that well. And then the Germans make it work, but it's incredibly expensive, incredibly complicated, and ridiculously unreliable. And then the Japanese take it, refine it, make it work, make it cheap, and you know, make it reliable. And then we all use it. And so I have a feeling that there was, at some point, some ridiculous engine layout with a transaxle and a drive shaft and a torque tube that we did first and fucked up so badly that the Germans then fixed it and then the Japanese made it reliable. Uh, I refuse, I, I, in, the, in the face of evidence, I will say no, I don't. It was just the Wikipedia okay. entry. I look forward to reading about the cars that match the description that you just described. There won't be. Uh, One of the earliest ones on that Wikipedia page was a Bugatti. Apparently some Bugatti had a transaxle. Hmm. That I seems very that. French. Uh, Bugatti was very innovative during that period. I would argue that like French cars in the in the pre-war era were of this caliber that we now consider like Italian cars in terms of like pushing the envelope mm -hmm. technically and being motorsports oriented and making desirable cars. I think that the French really occupied that role in the 1930s. Um, I wasn't more so than the. I, I was there. I'll t I trust me. Um, <laughs> Can I have that coffee that came in? Is that possible? I said, well, see, this is really, you know, now you guys are getting an insight into the carmudgeon leaf. What it takes disastrous. to make it run. Yeah, all it takes is, is a lot of caffeine and for Jason a, yeah. and snacks yeah. for me. Other, the other thing is that the Italians in our office want to kill me every time a Starbucks shows up because they're like, this is muddy water or dirty water or whatever they call it. And I'm like, shut up, you guys can't build a car. I'm sorry. Thank you. This is where I throw this at the uh, assistant and I'm like, I said no cream! Oh. You are quite the prima donna. Yeah, really. I, I, ordering Starbucks and not giving a fuck about anything. Um, sorry uh, for that, lovely. Now you guys, there, I feel like we're, we're developing a rapport with our audience where we can start telling them our dirty secrets. Like, I drink coffee. And probably- Scandalous. Scandalous. Um, can I have the phone back too while we're on the subject? Because there were other cars. <laughs> this is we're just gonna. This is we're gonna test to see how many times Armin can put his hand in without actually interfering. Getting a cameo. Mm -hmm. um, I just got a text from my e golf, my 2016 e golf, the one that I. When did you sell that car? Okay, so it is currently March. I returned that last October, so five months ago. Um, and it's still connected to my little Volkswagen Carnet account and has been auctioned and is now in a parking lot in Los Angeles somewhere, I, and I can see it, and every day it texts me, my windows are open and there's a chance of light rain in the forecast. Uh, well, it doesn't okay. text you that every day because there's not almost, a chance of, every day, yeah. of light rain in um, Southern California. Uh, okay. so, but anyways, and the, the car has not gone anywhere? How many? It has gone one mile. One mile since in you traded months, it in. It has gone one mile, has not been charged, no one's been using it. And the it. windows are open. No, well, the, yeah, the two left side windows. That's pretty tragic. What's tragic is I can't close them. Have you ever seen the Brave Little Toaster? No. Never mind. I uh, can't close them. I mean, this, only the Germans, to this to the point there, would come up with an app that allows me to see that the windows are, are open and not do fuck all about it. Mm. I've thought, I can honk the horn, and I've thought about like honking the horn, but then there needs to be like a little, uh, intercom function where I can be like, close my doors, close my doors, and freak them all out, and they're like, the car is possessed. But I would love to know what's going on with this poor car. Um, anyway, so the first, according to the Wikipedias, which is, you know, always, always, always accurate, the answer. Uh, notable front engine rear wheel drive layout vehicles with a transaxle design include 1898 to 1910, Deux Dion Bouton, a button, a button. Um, 1914 to 1939, Stutz, Bearcat. And then 29 to 36, Bugatti, 46. But then from there, it goes to Skoda, popular in 1934. 50, and then we go from 34 to 50 for Lancia Aurelia. Pagasso Z102. Lancia Those are kind of cool cars. What is, I, I don't even know what Pagasso that is. Pagasso is a like, Spanish exclusive sports car manufacturer that did a lot of really crazy stuff. Uh, and like sometimes coach built really beautiful cars, sometimes very like psychedelic, weird looking cars. There's a lot of weird details mm. in Pegasos. Maybe we can, like the shape of the shift knob and like just all this weird shit. They were, I think, twin cam V8s in early post war Spain. Uh, I, um, they're very expensive, like weird looking cars. You do uh, realize that all the times you go into details about this, like shifter and whatever else, you're gonna have to dig up a photo and send it to the editor so he can put it in this video? 
Uh, I'm going to speak Okay, let's not talk about uh, Pegasos anymore in that case. I'm just going to talk about things that everyone knows about, so we don't have to do uh, inserts for it. Okay, so Lancia Flaminia, DAF, DAF 600. 1961 Pontiac Tempest. That's one I didn't know. I didn't know that either. Apparently that car's pretty, uh, I mean, the other thing is that I, does it have to be independent rear suspension if you have that, if it's a transaxle? I guess not. Not necessarily, although you, how would you, you have the transmission moving with the whole axle? I don't know. Yeah. I, I, that's kinda, kind of a sophisticated trick anyway, especially mm -hmm. for American. I, I would love to know the backstory with that, but I'm I mean, sure there's something interesting. Wikipedia, but <laughs> uh, then everyone has to watch you use yeah. Wikipedia. Uh, Ferraris, oh, no. uh, that Here, one. Here's the thing. The list of Ferraris is, is huge. Uh, yeah, any mm -hmm. front-engined two-seat, 12-cylinder Ferrari since 196, since the 275 came out. 64. But isn't, can't we just say any front engine Ferrari? No, because the four seat cars did not have transaxles. Oh, that's right. Four seat cars, i.e., like the 400, which used a GM yes. three speed automatic. Or a five speed. Or a five speed manual. manual. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, and the GTC4 and the 330, 2 plus 2, all those cars have the transmission attached to the back of the engine. In Why? So fashion. it's very strange that Ferrari would engineer these cars two ways, right? The four doors would have, or the four seat I'm cars. I'm guessing would. it's a packaging thing. Yeah. To keep Why the floor the level low and also have space for back seats. Yeah. You can, you can have a transmission or a transaxle interfere with the trunk space, but to do that on the back seat would Well, be and also in those two seat cars, the luggage floor thing was quite a bit higher than mm -hmm. the rear seat level, and so well, you yeah. could use that space. Um, and the next one up after all that, so it's, it was for a lot of Ferraris, a Volvo 300 series in the 1970s, and that, I, I don't I mean, know anything about that. Right? I mean, that's, that's a, I think, one of those cars that was produced from 1976 through 1991, and that neither of us know what it is. That's because they didn't sell them in the US. I imagine, I don't know, you should have seen them if you lived in Europe in the late 80s. Uh, early 90s, but yes, I, and I'm sure I did, but I remember looking this up and not even recognizing the shape. I don't know what the hell this was thinking about. Um, but it goes, you know, whatever, for a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the usual suspects. And then Porsche 928, which mm -hmm. predates, no, no, 924 was first. So Porsche's first transaxle car was the 9, 924. Um, which is a really interesting project because that whole thing was supposed to be the Scirocco. Yes. Like that's a that's a fucked up story. 924 was a joint effort between. Actually, hold well, on. We have to go back to the 914. Right. So tell me that story. So the 914 was intended to be a Volkswagen, and uh, they sold them here as Volkswagen Porsches for a while. It, it, it both initially. badges. Right. Yes, it had a, both badges on the uh, on the back of the car. Uh, and so then this created this alliance between Porsche and Volkswagen. Uh, but that car replaced the 912, which was just a 911 with a four-cylinder engine. And uh, I guess the engine was so ancient that they were like, okay, we have to start doing something different now. Uh, I heard a slightly different story. Okay. That the, you know that all the Volkswagen Porsche, like all of the German car industry is just this inbred, incestuous, incestuous it's all the same family. Um, and I don't remember the names. I did this research for a, a while ago, but who, who, whoever was chairman of Porsche resigned? No, chairman of Volkswagen resigned and refused to, the next guy was no longer related, a blood relative of Porsche, and refused to give them the bodies in white at their cost or something. And so there was this, this battle where all of a sudden the whole thing fell apart and Volkswagen walked away from it. So from my understanding that VW- From the 914? From the 914. The 914 was supposed to be sold as a VW when it had a four cylinder and a Porsche when it had a six. Mm -hmm. um, but Volkswagen refused to participate in the whole thing, um, leaving Porsche on its own. So they put the four cylinder in it um, and they sold it as that in the US badges both in Europe was badged just as Porsche, I believe. Um, and the, the, there was something else, the 916 was there, the, do you know, have you driven a 916? I have not driven a 916. I have not, I was in a 916. So 916 is the basically Cayman version of, if you think of 914 as a Boxster, um, 916 would be a Cayman GT4 because it had a, a real 911 motor in it. Um, that was a very cool car. Um, but the, yeah, that was, there was a joint effort between Volkswagen and Porsche that fell apart. And then, so then they tried it again they a few years again. later for the replacement, which was the 924, which was the right. first transaxle car. And, and that car had a VW motor in it, but a transaxle. It was a Volkswagen. I mean, it yeah. was a Volkswagen. So the 924 shares 
a lot of parts with the Mark I Volkswagens. So you can take, like for example, visual things like switch gear and door handles, but also suspension A-arms, for example, were identical between the two cars. Um, How about valve covers? Uh, it was an Audi motor, mm. which was very similar to the VW blocks. I, I bet, I bet it, I bet it is. Um, but that was supposed to be the coupe, the, the sports coupe that they were going to sell, that VW was going to sell. Um, and once again, VW said, no, nah, forget it, and decided to make a front-wheel drive car out of the Golf, their new Golf that they called the, um, uh, the Scirocco. And Porsche was left to sell this half-baked, semi-Porsche. Not very of, Porsche at all. It's like somewhat Porsche. They, they, they drive, they handle, I've never driven a 924. Right. I've only driven a 944 and 968. But here's my question. If, if you look back at the history of Porsche, their first effort at everything basically sucks. It's always like Gen 2 is better and then Gen 3, 4, 5. Well, they've like, only done three things, so it's easy to make that argument because they made rear-engined like air-cooled <laughs> cars and then they made rear-engined water-cooled cars, and then they made like a variety of front-engine cars. Well, you can also basically go back to say the Beetle was their first effort, meh, <laughs> and then, then I the, mean, say, it, the 911 was the second one, and they got that. Um, I'm, I'm eventually. <laughs> kind of joking, because you know people get so upset when you call um, oh, yes, 911 Beetles. squashed Beetles. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but no, the 924 was, mm, from, what I, from what I gather in period reviews, not received all that well, sold pretty well. Um, it wasn't like panned. It was just kind of, I think, a pleasant car without a lot of character. And I think 944 really fixed that. Yes, it had a Porsche motor in it, and it, I think, visually was differentiated. I don't care for them personally. Um, what? I, it, it's a car that I always am a little underwhelmed by. How so? I don't like the noise. It's a four-cylinder. What do you want? Yeah, that's the issue. <laughs> okay. All right, but great handling, great right? chassis. Good looks. I like the way they look. I love the way that car looks. Um, the the early the eight valve cars are such an acoustic letdown. They don't rev. The engines don't have a lot of character. They don't have any personality. Um, but the steering was good. The suspension was great. Handling balance was amazing. Yeah, looks great. Handling balance. Pre eighty five and a half dashboard was atrocious. Heinous. It's Heinous. really an abomination. Yeah. Uh, so that's not a great, mm, I don't know, I don't, pers they don't, I don't gravitate towards So do you cars. like, well, that became obviously the 968, do you mm -hmm. like that at all? No, I daily drove one for a while, I didn't love it, that's why I sold it. Because the engine? Yeah, I just didn't like listening to it. I also was trying to commute long distances in it, and it was not really well suited to that. When you drove the pants off of it, it was very entertaining, but in conventional use, I didn't like it. And I replaced it with a 996, which in conventional use, I really enjoyed. Yeah. Because uh, it has this sort of liveliness. The thing about the 968 uh, is that, like, by that time, it's a three-liter. Yes, three-liter three with balance shaft was technology they licensed for Mitsubishi, yeah. which now everyone, almost every engine in production, yeah. every four-cylinder into the production today. But it's still, I just, I don't know, I didn't love it. Uh, and then, so around the same time, the 928 was coming out. I'm, this story has been told many times about how the 928 was supposed to replace the 911 because it had. You know, and they had the Weissach axle, which was meant to preserve the geometry under and high speeds so that you didn't get geometry changes at high speeds. Uh, and so, like, very sophisticated car that uh, was not a sports car the way that a 911 should be. I really like those cars. Um, you also Why? 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 Look at What's it and to listen like? to They're it. They're fucking horrible. They look like a nine, like if you took, 944 I think is the prettiest of the, the four cylinder transaxle cars, right? 24 is a little humdrum. 968, mm, that back end, I don't, whatever. What, the 944 is a near perfect industrial design even before the, the turbo bumper and everything else. If you took a 944 and you put an air hose in it and you left it overnight and came out in the morning, you would have this overgrown, bloated blob of a marshmallow 944 looking thing. They're fucking hideous. Okay, so not a 928 fan. I think Except they're just the gorgeous. I think they're gorgeous mm -hmm. cars. I love the way that the B pillar tilts forward. I think there's a lot of like interesting details about the car. I like the sophistication of it. It's to me, it's like it, I don't know. Do you like Mercedes Benz? You yes. like Mercedes Benz of that period? I think that that car is as close to Mercedes Benz as Porsche ever got. And there's something really charming about a like high quality Porsche from the 1970s because 911s were like hilariously outdated, like even by 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
So you get like you a vision of what Porsche could do if you gave them a clean sheet, and the car is pretty rad in that sense. Like it's ver like a sophisticated, like grown-up car. Like I, I had both at the same time, basically both 87s, 911 and 940, uh, 928, and they were the same color combination, same year, and it was so amazing how much more sophisticated of a car the 928 was, uh, in terms of like its performance and how effortlessly it delivered it, and like. Which ones you keep? I sold them both. Oh, God, good answer. <laughs> I, okay, so I should also say that my personal experience with a 928. And you drove that car and you enjoyed it. That was the red it. one? The, the one was silver with a burgundy interior that had the short rear end ratio. Short, okay, that one, yes. Okay, the, what, the reason I like that car is you had no mufflers on it. Correct. Right, so. So it sounds like a it muscle car. So shattered this, the windows like, on the front of my house when you pulled V8 up. V8 noises. <laughs> I mean, it was just full on power boat. Number two, mm -hmm. you put a short rear end in it so it no longer did 143 miles an hour in first gear and then stalled in second. And weren't there suspension changes to it? No, but it did have gold BBSs. Okay. All I remember was laughing at the noise. And it, was it a two valve or four valve car? Four valve. Remember, four valve car. Remember just laughing at the noise and then drifting it around a corner by mistake, thinking it would understeer and it just went completely like absolutely beautifully neutral and I'm like, ah, fuck it and turned a big drift out of it. What a dynamically fantastic car. My only real experience with the 928 is poor Mike Musto who bought that Prussian blue one and mm. it was an 86 and a half so it was an early four valve car mm -hmm. um, and he brought it to he had a ton of like little issues, um, including he wanted to do timing chains to make sure that belt. everything, belt, sorry, to make sure that everything's done. I said chains for a reason. He, oh, because there yeah. are, is a, a chain that drives the second camshaft off of the first camshaft, which is driven off the crank yes. with a belt. Right, and you can no longer get tensioners, you can no longer get anything, so our friend had to fabricate timing chain tensioners for the second one. Now I will say my VWs, my 16 valve VWs have a belt that drives the exhaust cam, which then drives the intake cam via a chain. Yeah, because your VW motor is like half a... Basically, they're, they're very similar in concept. However, Volkswagen was like, we don't need a tensioner because chains don't really stretch when they're this long. So they just put the cams in journals and they called it a day. The fact that they put a tensioner on a chain that's this long is the perfect example of how outrageously, ridiculously overcomplicated that car is. I told you, it and was like a Mercedes. It's fucking... <laughs> <laughs> it was the worst car I've ever worked on. The most frustrating... Uh, so our, our friend Nate worked on this car for eight months to do all kinds of stuff. Um, and he was about to lose his mind. Mike, Mike Musto was really upset, like, I want to drive my car. And every time he got it, it broke immediately again. And it wasn't Nate's fault, it was something else. But everything was done terribly on that car. It was overly complicated. Just taking the intakes off was something like 40 minutes, putting them back on, I should say. It was like 40 minutes because there were these gorgeous, Organ pipe, like pipe organs with these connectors, and, and they are all separate pieces. They're all separate pieces. Yeah. So the later twenty, the later thirty-two valve cars, it's a one-piece yeah. intake. Manifold. But I mean, dual air conditioning systems. Like, come on, the car which wasn't, was an option, which my car did not have. The car wasn't big enough to actually put people in the back seat. Why would they actually? If they were contortionistic enough to be able to fit in that back seat, let them suffer without air conditioning. They also had separate rear visors, like normal like yeah. front visors, but they're for the rear passengers that flip down from the headliner, which is a very cool touch. In any case, why? Because it's the like it was their like effort to make the most sophisticated car they could, and there's something admirable about that. There's the something why admirable. Like an eight when, series or a W140, you're just like I can't believe. It's a reason when Mercedes does it. Mercedes does it. They can overcomplicate things and they can fuck it up, but they're doing it to advance the art of a luxury car. Porsche, the 928, to me, just shows a fundamental lack of understanding about what made that car company popular and successful in the first place. Well, that's why the 928 didn't last. Thank God. And you know, like, you know, I don't know if everyone out who watching this understands it was an American who saved the 911. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, the Germans had fully had, like, a full plan of killing the 9-11 Yeah, Peter Schutz. That sounds very German. Yeah, but he was American. 
There's a very famous story about how he went onto the wall and the 9-11 line was supposed to end in 1978 or 80 and he just drew on the wall off the end of the paper and onto the wall and around the corner With about the, the end yeah. of the 9-11, how it was going to go on forever. And he said, Do, does everybody understand? And yeah. then the, the result of that meeting was the Carrera 3-2 because then they were like, oh, let's like improve the 9-11. Uh, uh, which yes. replaced the SC. Was the right answer. I, I, the 928s. Yes, because he philosophically understood what made, what, why people bought Porsches. And why is that? Because, uh, because they want a connection to the road and they want a pure driving experience. No, no, no. Why did he understand? Yes. Oh, but why I, did he understand it? I don't know. You're saying he's American? Germans, Instead of Germans were like, oh, this is better. It's progress. Every, we've talked about this before. Every single German car that ever happened was an aberration and it was one rogue person who refused to do what the leader of the company told them to do. Every good, anyway. like, interesting German Every car. Every interesting German car. Start, you know, from, from GTIs, we've talked about this. GTIs to 2.16s to 6.3s. All of them were always aberrations in someone who wasn't doing what they were told. Um, and the Germans always seem to misunderstand what their brands mean and what makes them special. Um, E.g. BMW today. Exactly. But that's why one of the things that I hate the most about the 928, it could be an amazing car. And I, I wish, I hope other people have better experiences working on them than I did. And I didn't love driving it. I mean, it's perfect for Musto because it's like a big, lopey V8 and you know, very like, you know, big, heavy car. And he's a muscle car guy. Um, but it's, it was the opposite of what I like in cars in general. And more importantly, the opposite of what I like about Porsches. Um, so even if that car was amazing though, I hate it for the fact that it almost killed the 911 and it would have killed, that car would have, if given the opportunity, killed Porsche off completely. And fuck that, fuck the car for it. Where the 924 was a, was a stupid argument between Volkswagen and Porsche where they're like, again, you know, this is like the, the friends that, you know, break up and then get back together and break up and get divorced and then get married again and get divorced again. And they tried, it kept not working. And ultimately the 924 and became 944, 968, nice cars. All of which had transaxles. Okay. And they were yeah, cool. so we're supposed to be talking about transaxles. That's right. We are, we just talked about all of these. <clears throat> And we didn't talk about the Lanchas at all, though. Tell me about the fuck do I know about a Lancia? Uh, they're just Isn't like, there one around here? It's over there. That's not a, a real Lancia. <gasps> a Delta Integrale is not. Ladies and gentlemen, Derek Tam hyphen Scott just said the Lancia Delta Integrale is not a real Lancia. Uh, so when they uh, were purchased by Fiat, and I think this was in 1968 or 1970, uh, they did a lot of like sort of parts sharing and sort of like the sensible things that you do if you're an automobile conglomeration. And prior to that, Lancia was like this company that made all these really extraordinary, expensive things that were like just incredibly sophisticated. So they did all they did all these innovative things like the first monocoque car was Lancia, the first like unitary non-separate frame car was Lancia in, do you know what year? You wanna guess what year Lancia did this? 58. 1924 with the Lambda. Um, so they were making unitary chassis cars in 1924. They were making transaxle cars in the early 50s. They made the world's first V6 mm -hmm. in the Aurelia. Uh, they would do all this dumb shit like, what? VR4. Yes, the first V4s, which were done also pre-war. Mm -hmm. the, the, Lambda, the Lambda was also a V4, mm -hmm. uh, which is the first unitary chassis car. Which so is a, a VR4 car a, single head. Yes, yeah. a common cylinder head V4 uh, in addition to the, uh, the unitary chassis in the 1920s. Uh, they had like thermostatically controlled radiator blinds so that like the, the, the radiator would be covered by metal slats when the coolant mm -hmm. was cold and then once the, the engine warmed up then it would open the blinds. Is this before anyone came up with the idea of a thermostat as a thermostat inside the cooling system? I this guess. This was first, right? Well, yeah. I guess, yeah. Uh, they just were always doing weird, the inboard Innovating. like brakes in the back. Mm -hmm. They would do universal joints that were mounted in the wheel hubs. They kept trying out shit. And not only that, but they also made cars that were like incredibly beautifully like turned out high quality cars. Even if they were like shitty low performance, like economy type cars, mm -hmm. like with 40 or 50 horsepower, they would be built to higher standards than a contemporary Ferrari. And that's not an exaggeration. I mean, Ferraris of that period weren't built to particularly high right. standards, but like Lancia cars, no matter like how low the performance level, and they were never really super high performance cars, were always built to like world class standards that were better than any other Italian car, mm. which is why Fiat had to bail them out because they kept <laughs> letting engineers make decisions instead of uh, like and ignoring the accountants who were like, we can't keep 
mass producing like low performance cars at relatively affordable performance po uh, price points mm -hmm. and making them to this standard with this level of mechanical sophistication. So like the pre, that's what I mean when I say real lanchas, those ty like cars are really exceptional world-class cars that you need to kind of be a weirdo or connoisseur, depending on your perspective, to like really appreciate. And that's why vintage launches, especially the six-cylinder cars like Flaminias and Aurelias are so sought after by people who like have spent enough hours around like kind of crappy Italian cars where they're like, wow, there is a high quality Italian car. So like Transaxle was part of that. And so they would have the same kind of issues that Transaxle cars always do, like driveline vibrations and mm -hmm. stuff like that. They're very sensitive to setup, which is Why don't you Italian. own a Lancia if you're, I mean, cause you've now given me such an, a wonderfully impassioned I'm, speech that I feel like I need uh, to have a Lancia. A pre-Fiat Lancia? Mm -hmm. uh, I will get there. I eventually will own one. I'll own like a Fulvia. I, what, I, what I really want is I want a V6 Lancia and mm. V6 Lanchas are kind of expensive. Mm. And so I just haven't been at a point where it's like, uh, cause the cheapest one would be a Flaminia Berlina and you could get one of those for like 25 or $30,000 if you could find one. Is that the one that we found that saw that Carson Coffee? Yes. Okay, all right, I, I have to say. This uh, is typical Lancia. That, this that, is what you're about amazing. to say is so representative of the way this company makes So cars. we're like, we're at Carson Coffee, we're looking around, looking at all these cars and whatever, and you know, sometimes some of these Carson and Coffees are total overload. It's so many cars that you wind up just talking to your friends and just glancing at the cars and you leave realizing you haven't actually seen anything. But I think I dragged you over you to this car. You lost your, sh you actually peed. And there was a puddle of pee and you were like, oh, <laughs> and we're like, all, all of our friends were like, has he, like, he doesn't drink coffee. So we're like, he's drank too much or like did a line of Coke or something. What the fuck? And he was very excited about this Flaminia. Berlina. Berlina, whatever. And we're like, okay, whatever. It's another weird looking Lancia until he pointed out that there are wipers on the back window. And I'm like, wow, okay, anything with rear wiper, like, well, It's a sedan. Ooh. It's a sedan. To be clear, yeah. it's a, a four-door conventionally shaped sedan. With a fairly upright wind, wind screen or window in the back, so you wouldn't think it would have like, but I'm like, yes, okay, so it has wiper and two of them. Ha ha, Camry wagon, blah, 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 Camry wagon had two wipers in the back. And he's like, no, dickwad, look inside. And I looked inside and there were two more wipers on the inside of the fucking window. And all four that of them would move like this. And it was to keep it, that was a defroster. Because it didn't have a rear defroster. Or that was the rear defroster. That, was, that is so unbelievably, ridiculously, fabulously cool. Therefore, I don't care what it costs you. You should have one. Yeah. You deserve it. The other thing about that car is that the rear vent windows are vacuum operated. So there's a row of three buttons on the dashboard and the leftmost one opens the left rear vent window uh, and then uh, the right one opens the right rear and then you push the one in the middle and then they both close. So once one is open, once both are open, you can't close just one. Correct. You have to like close both and then open Correct. the other one? That's right. Uh, I so think it has, forgiven. Is it like one of these strong like things that'll like literally, Excuse me, a little it's too much coffee. It's very, uh, it's very we'll like lop your finger off. Slow and quiet. It's totally silent. Like it's Mercedes very, yeah. Pullman six hundred. Yeah. So like, it's just that is the way cool. that they make cars. So anyway, uh, that, I, that's I wanted. This was my opportunity to go on a Lancia rant and how much I like those the pre Fiat Lanchas. And that's why I describe the de the Integrale. I love the Integrale. I owned one. I would own another one. Uh, but it is a different like vibe from the early yeah, cars, so right? This is a, like a rally car where they're like, let's like go to town and make a world beating car that's kind of like Fiat crappy inside where the mm -hmm. dashboard it, like is kind of decomposing while you drive the car. Love, uh, and here so we go like, again, I love, I love how a couple episodes back, we oh, the we, turbo <laughs> episode. <laughs> we're talking about, <laughs> we're talking about like. We're talking about Delta Integrales and you're like, eh, it's kind of crappy. You make the best eight, eighth car. And, you know, we have two of them in the office. They belong to our boss who's like, you know, you guys really did shit on the Integrale. Delta Integrale. And we're like, hold on. So we sort of replayed the episode and I did. I replayed the episode in my head. I'm like, how is it that we are both hopelessly in love with the Delta Integrale and we couldn't find a single nice thing to say about it? And here you are again. Well, the dashboard decomposes as you drive it. He, 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 he. I don't care, I want one. No, it, th that's the stuff that doesn't matter. It's a car that's, it, that really emphasizes or underlines to you, the driver, what you care about if you're a driving enthusiast, right. which is that like the, the amount of giggles you have while you're driving, and at that, it is incredible. And all the other costs that go with it, including like motor failures and like the poor interior quality, like all of that's like, ah, it's Italian. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I just, he just said a very bad word in some language. 
<clears throat> um, don't look it up. Don't have Google Translate. OK. Um, uh, but so it's a very different vibe from the early launches, mm -hmm. where there's this yeah, like sort of deliberate sense. eleganteness to the way the cars are built, as opposed to this sort of like fiat kind of like it's a rally car. It needs to go at, fast. Look, at around. the end of the day, that is the Delta Negroli is a Delta. It is a golf-sized, inexpensive car. economy car, and you know it happened to be that version of it was fucking amazing. I mean, that is the model on which like the Lancer and Impreza mm -hmm. were built, totally. which is you take a sort of crappy economy car and then you put like you boost the hell out of it and give it four-wheel drive and then go clean everyone's clock when you go rallying. Every hot hatch. It's yeah. every hot hatch starts with a you know a shitbox underpinnings and becomes one of our favorite cars in the world. Um, I looked up some, some other ones. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want us to get caught on forever. But of course, so the Alpha GTV6 became the, that chassis sort of begat the Milano. Well, it all car. started with the Alfetta. Alfetta. So which was a four-cylinder version of the GTV6, mm -hmm. but it was also available as a sedan because Alfa Romeo, and they'll make a transaxle four-door sedan that's conventional looking and sell it to the public en masse. And then that, you know, The unsuspecting public who has no idea that- That it has inboard brakes and yes. that when they need rear pads and rotors that it costs as much as- $10,000. But a clutch uh, is easy, fiat. on the other hand. Yes, because yeah. you're looking at it yeah. and it's right there. Uh, and then that became the, the Milano. Which became? The, the 164. No. Oh, the Milano Verde? <laughs> no, the Milano sort of. Oh, the SZ yes. and RZ. The SZ is the top of my list. Absolute 100% most wanted alpha for me. Really? I want that fucking thing so bad. I've never driven one. I mean, neither. I hear they drive wonderfully. I'm scared to death because I drove a Z1 once. And that BMW was a, a BMW Z1. Z1. And that was like, yeah, I kind of want something outrageous looking, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And it drove amazingly well, which set off a two-year search, which resulted in me coming within $1,000 of buying one, 1,000 euro. And then the woman pulled it off the market, and I got busy with work and whatever. And I have that same crush for an SZ. And I'm hoping, like, I've always hoped that they're terrible, that the first time I drive one, I'm going to be like, oh, thank God it's horrible. I don't have to have one. But everyone says they're amazing. That's what I've heard as well. Yeah, fuck. I just, I, I don't one. think I could look at it. I enjoy that it's weird looking, but I don't think I enjoy it enough t to want to own one. Oh, I love, I mean, I was just driving a, a, the new Genesis G90 around this week and I had a guy in a brown 911 actually stop in the middle of the road with his mouth open, staring at the front of this car like, huh? And I just think- Because it's so heinous. Because it's so heinous. And I think it's so imposing and so attention getting. But I think the SC would do that. I think people would lose their fucking minds. It would be so much fun to drive that around, to just peop watch people go, the fuck? It would just be great. Plus, I think it's amazing looking. Yeah. Ugly as sin, but amazing. So. Have you watched the period press videos? They're very 80s. It's, yeah. it's well worth it. Is it like time. sped up footage of the car? Like, oh, boom, boom. yeah, and like the sort of neon 80s like uh, vibe. bad enough to turn me off from wanting one. Um, uh, what else do you have here? So we have Corvette C5 is when it started with uh, Corvettes and mm -hmm. the transaxle. But we, and we have talked about front engine Ferraris already. Oh, Panos, Esperante, Plymouth Prowler. You know, I didn't realize that was a transaxle car. I didn't um, care that it was a transaxle. Well, car. that was a conventional. That was a three, you know, three and a half liter V6. That was all conventional. No, stuff. actually, that's the most interesting thing about the Prowler to me is that it's a transaxle car. You ever see one without bumpers? Mm -mm. Ever seen a grown man naked? <laughs> Sorry, that was total airplane. <laughs> Have you ever seen one without bumpers? That's an airplane <laughs> reference, guys. Um, <laughs> he swears. Um, that, yeah, Prowler without bumpers, actually I like it. That thing only had a manual. Shelby Series 1, that was an interesting thing. I think that had a North Star up front um, and then some crazy transaxle in the back. Maserati Coupe and Spider, 2001. Um, mm, this is the uh, Italian design car. And, and it, I guess what this all underscores for me is that there has been, never been a boring car with a transaxle. Every single car mm. with a transaxle with this layout of a front engine reared around a transaxle. That Volvo. 
The Volvo 300? Uh, Volvo might be, the, might be the one, because when we go through this list, it's like, you know, Aston Repeat, as we mentioned. Alpha Mer 8C, Competizione. Ferrari FF. Mercedes Lexus LFA. LFA. Yeah. Every eight. single time a car gets a trans, yeah, with SLS. 8C, Alpha 8C, Competizione. Yeah. And we're going to have to say that again and again and again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, every single car that has a transaxle is kind of automatically cool. So it, uh, we're always looking for patterns in cars, yeah. and it's like, what, what, like, is there a tell? And I think having a transaxle is probably one of the most reliable tells for a car that's going to be kind of cool and interesting. For example, the QP5. Yeah. Uh, but it's kind of a weird packaging constraint where you have to really care about vehicle dynamics and prioritize it above things that like normally would come much higher in a car, especially with four doors. So like if someone ever does this particularly, a four four door transaxle car, uh, it automatically is a cool car in my book. I'm in full agreement. Can I just go and do burnout? You need that? you need to pee, don't you? Because you've been having a lot of no. Caffeine. I just want to go drive that quadruple. Okay. This one broke. Well, you'll roast the you'll this roast one. The will, clutch. That one will break too. Yes. <laughs> uh, oh. Oh. 